All right. Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, I am so delighted to be here today with um, the leaders of the three organizations that our church has identified as recipients of our first COVID-19 relief grants. So um, each of these local Richmond organizations that are doing frontline work to help those most impacted by this pandemic, by this crisis, um, are receiving $20,000 donations from First Presbyterian Church. And we're so grateful to our Outreach Council and our Community Partner Grants Committee that did the work of identifying um, which of the organizations locally, because there are so many great organizations, were really um, on the front lines and wanted um, to be our first recipients. So I'm really delighted that um, you have all made some time for this conversation today to help us learn more about the great work that you're doing. Um, so I'm going to let you introduce yourselves and your organizations to start out. Um, Karen, do you want to start for us? Sure. I'm Karen Stanley, and I'm the president and CEO of Caritas. And um, just, we're so thrilled to be a part of this first cohort. So thank you. Great, thank you. And Anita? I'm Anita Bennett. I am with The Daily Planet. Um, I am thankful that we have this opportunity to be here and I'm happy to introduce a little bit about our services about what we do later. Great, thanks. Hi, and I'm Kelly Kinghorn. I'm the executive director of Homeward, and we're the regional planning and support agency working to reduce homelessness here in Richmond. Wonderful. So maybe now we can go around and maybe go in, in reverse order and start with Kelly and tell us a little bit about um, the work of your organization pre-COVID and now in the midst of, of uh, this pandemic. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Um, so at Homeward, we have, uh, for over 20 years, worked together with all the partners, uh, with Caritas, Daily Planet, and other great nonprofits to understand the needs of our neighbors experiencing homelessness and then to collaboratively address uh, the, those needs, right? Really to help people connect to housing, healthcare, services, whatever they might need. And, you know, before the pandemic, Honestly, we worked in a scarcity mode of really, we worked really hard collaboratively to make the best use of what we knew were inadequate services, right? Because homelessness was a crisis in February and, you know, all before that. Uh, and so it's been, um, in some ways, a gratifying shift to be able to tackle this um, unprecedented crisis together, that we had the uh, infrastructure available and the partnerships that we really just cranked them up to, you know, beyond high level with the crisis to really come together and to, you know, address the crisis, address the risk from coronavirus. And then I think to continue to dig into um, the inequities that feed into homelessness. So, yeah, thank you, Kelly. Anita, how about at the Daily Planet? Well, the Daily Planet has been around for about 50 years. We provide primary care, dental care, behavioral health to include substance um, abuse and use disorders. Um, prior to the coronavirus, our primary focus was inpatient. Yeah. So meaning uh, people would come into the facility, they would see one of our providers. Uh, most of it was done, and most of our work was done face to face. Uh, we worked closely with Homeward and Caritas, but mainly in those capacities, um, and probably not with the same sense of urgency that you're seeing after coronavirus, so BC and AC. So AC after coronavirus, we are definitely in that space of that urgency that we need to move quickly. Uh, the infrastructure that Kelly spoke of, um, I was thankful that when I stepped in, a lot of that hard work had already been built and the foundations were there. So we just really needed to put some additional effort to coordinating it. Um, probably the largest lift for the Daily Planet was to move from those face-to-face -face, uh, meetings to much like what we're doing right now, getting everyone used to telehealth visits, um, even behavioral health visits have been all transferred predominantly as of right now to telehealth. Um, and helping some of our partners have access to things like um, the computers, the computer stations that they need. Uh, we will currently supply a what we call a connect 
connection point terminal out in the community to allow community members who don't have access to a telehealth uh, platform, they can use ours and connect to a provider every single day. Um, so I've been really lucky that the time that I came in, it was stressful with the pandemic, but I'm blessed that I have so many supportive partners around me um, that had already done so much work to make everything possible. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And Karen, I know there was lots going on at Caritas even before. <laughs> it's like, I don't hardly remember life before coronavirus. It just feels like it's some a fog way off in the distance. It feels like we've been so intentional and so focused on it for a while. Wow. So Caritas has been around for 33 years now. Um, obviously, the connection that we had with First Pres. Um, was predominantly as an emergency shelter, as providing shelter for our, our folks that were um, experiencing homelessness. Um, over the years, we've, our, our relationship with First Pres has, has gone deeper with one of our other programs, The Healing Place, which is our residential recovery program for men that are struggling with substance use disorder. And um, you guys were there from the beginning of that program 15 years ago. Um, the uh, Furniture Bank was uh, created in uh, 2008 to deal with a need that we had in our system of people moving from crisis back into housing with basically nothing but the clothes on their back. And um, so we now provide assistance through a partnership of about 90 organizations that uh, send their, refer their clients, their members of our Furniture Bank, and they refer clients to get the basic starter package. And then um, because of my joint venture with Healing Place and Caritas for five years, we realized that there was a big gap in the employment, uh, the employability piece of clients that have significant barriers. So our fourth program um, was uh, the healing or the works program, I'm sorry, um, that provides that, that path back to employment for um, men and soon to be women that have significant barriers. Um, you know, the other little pro project that we've been working on is this $28 million facility, which has continued to move forward despite the pandemic. And um, we are uh, online to be operational in there in, in September. Um, but things that have changed since uh, COVID, um, the shelter, obviously, you know, as congregations began to be concerned about providing shelter for people within their facility, which really the only the women's was still moving from congregation to congregation. The men's has been co-located at 700 Dinwiddie where the healing place is for two, a little over two years now. And the family program sunset last a year ago, March. So, and those beds were not lost to our system. They were um, divvied up amongst other wonderful service providers that, that help families. Um, but the, the, women, it was pretty significant because we had them housed for a while in the high-risk shelter. And then when um, they closed that down, we were like, oh, what do we do now? Because we had this, we were expecting and hoping and praying that that would be our bridge to the opening of the Caritas Center where they'll have a permanent home. And that was not the case. So they are actually in a hotel now at the tune of about 7,300 bucks a week, um, which is pretty, pretty heavy lift for us. Um, the men's program, the men's healing place was uh, locked down for nine weeks and we worked very closely with the Daily Planet during that time um, where uh, we are very proud to say that over all of our programs, we've had nine positive cases, eight, eight of which were asymptomatic. Um, they are starting the process of bringing in a new cohorts of men at a time, about six at a time. I think we're going to try to raise that where they're all tested at the Daily Planet. Mm -hmm. Then they're quarantined together till the results of their tests come back. And then they're slowly integrated back into the recovery program. Because we know COVID has just put a spotlight on that. And addiction has gone, you know, up um, with the stresses and the trauma that's come out of COVID. Um, right now, we're, do, we're doing some shopping at the furniture bank. Um, we're doing most of it uh, uh, via telephone, and we're actually making the selections. We're doing hands-free delivery, uh, so we're, we're just delivering the furnishings to them. And the works program has stayed through COVID because the men were already being quarantined together. It's a program that's predominantly for the men of the healing place, and so we haven't allowed other people to come in during this time. But we've graduated two classes since COVID started, and 
they've gotten some new skills. There have been some silver linings. Now they, they, they know how to do an interview via Zoom. So um, we've hired our program manager over Zoom for the Healing Place for Women. And um, we are getting, we've had the congregations um, sponsor apartments and take on registries to do all the soft goods, which I know uh, is part of what we're doing with you guys. And um, it's just been, it's been a little bit surreal that we've accomplished so much, even in these crazy times. And, you know, Homeward's role in uh, helping provide the funding for isolation in hotels has been you know, we couldn't have done it without that partnership. So it's been a really part, uh, important partnership with both uh, Daily Planet and Homeward through all this. Well, and I just want to share, and then I know Kelly's going to talk some about the collaboration, but when I um, spoke with each of you to let you know about the donation and shared that we were also making donations to these other organizations, I think you were all as excited. Yes. <laughs> That, you know, for the other organizations as you were for your own, which would just made it so clear to me how, you know, collaborative you are. And so, Kelly, please tell us more about that. Well, well I mean, so Karen uh, mentioned this and um, Anita, that, you know, one of the biggest, the sort of the, the central piece of our regional pandemic response has really involved, um, you know, Daily Planet and Caritas and our other shelter partners where um, at Homeward we've, you know, made contracts with hotels and support services and cleaning companies and security staff. Uh, and we work with Daily Planet. So they've really provided us with solid public health guidance, right? So we really, that connection between homelessness and health has frankly never been clear. It, Homelessness has always been a threat to health and wellness um, and for people with behavioral health issues, but the pandemic just exposed the, the increased risk, especially for people living outside. And so as a community, we wanted to start by offering people a safe indoor place to be, right? Where they could have a bathroom, where they could wash their hands, or take a shower and just, you know, really start that pathway to something more stable. And we did it collaboratively from the beginning, you know, our first conversation about the pandemic was with the medical director of the Daily Planet, someone from Caritas, and then that quickly evolved to a training for all of our shelters of how do you respond to coronavirus? How do we keep shelter residents and shelter staff safe? Um, and so, and that continues to this day. So we partner with Daily Planet. Um, they're doing the medical side and screening and testing for COVID. Uh, at Homeward, we put someone in a hotel stay for a short term, and then they're transferred to one of our shelter partners to get the more robust and well-rounded supportive services they need to address the housing and uh, other support services they need. And so really, like in a nutshell, uh, this is how our community is responding to this pretty significant crisis. And, you know, we were, you know, especially in early March, and it continues, people experiencing homelessness have high rates of infection in other communities because they, their shelters weren't able to respond and spread people out and to isolate. They didn't have the, the close guidance um, from, you know, Daily Planet of like reading all the CDC guidance, because I'm not a medical person, but, you know, the um, Dr. Cook has read all of that and, and interpreted it and trained homeless service providers. And so it really, everything we've done has just um, strengthened that collaboration. It's increased the urgency of the work we're doing and the scale, certainly, right? Like most people, we're working, you know, significantly longer hours, but what we're doing is a little bit different, but it's not that different. Like the general focus and mission that drives our agencies is still the same. It's to help you know our neighbors in crisis connect to what they need to take their next step. Yeah, thank you. Um, Anita, is there anything that you wanna add in terms of the collaboration or partnership? It's really great to hear how closely that, that collaboration has, it's really made everyone's work more effective. Kelly mentioned it briefly, our chief medical officer here took a very strong lead in wanting to educate, wanting to get out there and build um, stronger bridges. Um, one of the first things we did is we opened a COVID clinic. So we have a COVID clinic where we assess and test individuals free of charge Monday through Friday. Um, and we wanted to make certain that was available to all people. 
Um, and it became even more important as the pandemic progressed and we began to know there were different subsets of the population, um, whether it be people of color or individuals who are undocumented or individuals who are homeless, who are at serious risk. Um, and they had limited access to care and limited ways to recover should they be positive. And what we found is, is without all three of the groups working together, we were missing. We had a huge gap in that care and people cannot recover appropriately without all three of our organizations working in conjunction towards that common goal. Um, the nice thing is, is once we, we leave off on the medical follow-up piece, it's very, I felt very confident and Dr. Cook felt confident that very talented organizations were gonna pick it up and help those individuals continue on their journey forward. Um, so that is what made it so successful. Yeah, that is great to hear. Well, um, I, I wanted to acknowledge that we're um, sending this conversation out to our congregation on um, the Juneteenth holiday. And um, I think that has risen in our consciousness even more in these recent days. Um, but I imagine it's been in your consciousness for a long time, given the disparities that we see um, in the populations that are often in need of the kinds of services that you provide. But also, um, I think the way that our congregation has talked about it is that the coronavirus has almost shown us like an x-ray of our society, and we're seeing underneath the surface and the way that um, these, you know, systemic and, and structural inequities have, have led um, different populations to, to be affected negatively by um, experiencing homelessness, by being uninsured or underinsured um, in terms of, you know, the kinds of work training and job availability and that kind of thing. All of these are work that you do. So I'd love to just hear if you have comments on, on what you see with, with that. Yeah, and Amy, I can start. Um, you know, at Homeward, we've been working uh, with our partners in homeless services probably for about two years now to really understand the role of racial inequities on homelessness. Mm -hmm. And we've started that as we do most things at Homeward with looking at data. What do people tell us is happening in their lives? And one of the, you know, immediate things um, that we were looking at was the percentage of people experiencing homelessness who are African-American, and it's almost double uh, the percentage of African-Americans in our community. Uh -huh. And so, you know, so that was just sort of indicative of, um, you know, that homelessness is an artifact of historical and systemic racism in the housing market, employment, incarceration, and that rolls out, you know, to healthcare and all the things you mentioned. So, we as a system or network of providers had been trying to understand that data as a starting point to see, you know, what does it tell us? And then particularly, what's the experience of people experiencing homelessness uh, throughout the system? So looking at our outcomes different for people of color, what opportunities do we have? Are we, you know, um, providing training for staff to understand those issues and so to respond more compassionately and more appropriately. And so we know that uh, our goal of focusing on you know, housing and healthcare and recovery and wellness, that these things will lead to uh, better outcomes for all people experiencing homelessness, but particularly for our uh, African-American neighbors experiencing homelessness. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. Um, Karen, do you wanna add to that? I would just say that you know we are we are feeling the pain of our brothers and sisters of color, and um, I think because Caritas is such a unique culture of um, probably twenty five percent of my staff have been through one of our programs, so we've been really intentional about providing space to. Um, to talk about what's going on and to um, recognize that the triggers that might be coming out of some of this. Um, we understand that, you know, especially at the healing place, um, there's so many of our men that have been incarcerated. So they've been through the system and obviously there, there is, a, it's a larger, our, our people of color, it's a, it's more than half um, at the healing place. So 
we've just been really intentional about it because we, we you know, I, I feel as a white woman very um, obligated and very um, um, impassioned by being part of the solution and being providing uh, a, more training for staff. We're going to have some, um, we're, we're working right now on some curriculum stuff and some and staff training to, to deal with the biases and the equities, inequities, um, understanding um, just the why behind what's going on, just because not everybody knows. Just like not everybody, you know, understood the, you know, what's going on behind the, the monuments. I mean, just really the education piece that goes along with it. We're just, we're trying to really be intentional about that at Caritas. Yeah, that's great to hear. I think there's, we, we are feeling a need for a lot of education and sort of excavating history and um, better understanding of, of how we've got to where we are today. Um, Anita, do you, do you want to comment on um, any of that? I know your internet is a bit in and out. Right, looks like maybe she's frozen here for a minute. Um, well, uh, it really, this has been such a meaningful conversation and especially to hear just how closely connected all of you are. And I could not be more grateful. And I know our congregation feels the same for the work that you're doing in the community and that we can support it. And I know this is not a one-time thing. We will continue to do so. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to connect with all of you and look forward to an ongoing relationship and finding ways that we can continue to support you. But please know that we are praying for you. We're so grateful for the work you do and um, we're here to help. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We yeah. just we look forward to expanding our relationship with you once we get into the Caritas Center in new and exciting ways. Yes, yes. We're looking forward to that. Well, thank you so much for, for making time for this today. I know you guys are really busy doing great work and, and really appreciate your time. Thank you.